Earlier this year, on the 13th of January at 8 in the morning, around then, every phone in the state of Hawaii received this alert. Ballistic missile threat inbound. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. For 36 minutes, everybody panicked. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. They hid in their staircases. They got in bed and held each other. And they stared down the last few minutes of their lives. And then, just like that, it was over. It was a false alarm. With tensions in the world the way that they are, it's pretty easy to see that this could have been a reality. Experts say that it would take about 20 minutes for North Korea to strike Pearl Harbor if they launched an ICBM right now. And well, despite the fact that Trump says he's neutralized their threat, he hasn't. It sort of seems like we've never been closer to World War III. But actually, if you look at it another way, I think we've never been closer to world peace. I think it's how we choose to identify with one another that's going to make the difference. It's pretty obvious that the world is kind of going through something. The human species is othering ourselves. On social media, we just shout in echo chambers and just confirm our own bias. And that's the least extreme. The most extreme, we have walls separating us. And this isn't just hypothetical scenarios. This is actually happening. Palestinians and Israelis are forbidden to communicate with one another. They don't know each other. North and South Korea, it's the same, and it's as unpredictable as ever. And Trump separated parents from their children at the US border and blamed the other side for it. Whether or not you think he's causing the polarization in the United States, there's no doubt he's exacerbating it. But we can't stop talking to each other. And even more importantly, we have to listen to each other's experiences. Because when we stop listening, we dehumanize and call each other animals. And when you call people animals, it's easy to put them into cages. Well, growing up, we didn't hear the stories of the people underneath the mushroom cloud, the atomic bomb survivors. We were just taught that it was a good thing that ended the war quickly. And that even my grandfather was a hero because he was the only one on both of the planes that dropped the atomic bombs. It's not lost on me that here I am in Japan as a friend, 70 years after we were enemies, and that this is Nagasaki Prefecture, the city that my grandfather risked his life to destroy. And you welcomed me. You accepted the work that I set out to do. And every day you teach me what's possible. To me, I think peace is possible. Because if we can come together from the opposite sides of the atomic bombings, I think anybody can. When I got here, I learned about the scale of the destruction. I learned that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not just military cities, but they were home to thousands of children, like this woman here. I learned this from organizations that are taking part in the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, known as ICANN. 400, over 400 NGOs have come together to abolish the nuclear threat. And in 2017, ICANN was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their work to make nuclear weapons illegal. Peace Boat and Hibakusha Stories are two organizations within ICANN whom I work closely with that aim to bring atomic bomb survivor testimony to the world. Hibakusha Stories has brought 40,000 students to hear atomic bomb survivors in New York. And not only that, but they brought the grandson of President Truman and myself, because they don't just teach a message of the dangers of nuclear war. They also encourage a message of reconciliation. But if learning from history helps us from repeating it, we have to listen to both sides of the attack to understand not just what happened, but how. It was my grandfather's job to make sure that the bomb went off in the middle of the air to cause the maximum amount of destruction below. 
it was expensive to train such a position, so he was used twice. And he would have been used a third time if there was an attack. But before he was my grandfather, before he was the double crew member, he was just Jake, a 20-year-old kid. He was studying mechanical engineering at Johns Hopkins University. He had about 30 foster brothers and sisters, children, German refugee children, my great-grandmother took in to help find permanent homes. Now, these weren't orphans. They were sent by their parents to safety. And he knew something terrible was happening to Europe's Jews. And that's why he wanted to fight. But he was too young. And then Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. And his parents lost all argument. Well, he was really smart. And he kept placing out of combat. And they wouldn't let him fight. He found out he was marked for the Manhattan Project. And on this first day of the project, they told him that their mission was going to end the war. And so he thought, well, that's, that's great. I'm going to stay here, and then the war will be finished. He used to say that when you go down to the ocean, and you walk out into the water, and you kick up the sand, and it billows, that's what the mushroom clouds look like. And in 1991, he was diagnosed with bone cancer. He died the same way that many of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki died. And there's no doubt that he was exposed. He was a hibakusha, as the atomic bomb survivors are called in Japanese. But the question I'm always asked by reporters, whenever they do ask, is did he express any guilt about what he did before he died? No. He didn't. But he never stopped talking about what he did either. He believed it was his mission in life to bear witness to what he called the worst acts of man's inhumanity to his fellow man. He'd hoped we'd find a better way, a way to get along, a way to never let this happen again. But how did it happen in the first place? Is it just because of resources and ideology? I don't think so. I think it's because we were separated. We didn't know each other, and that's how we dehumanized each other. I listened to the stories of the nuclear holocausts that my grandfather's planes unleashed. The survivors, they lived through hell. They experienced trauma beyond words. And seven decades later, they still speak out until their last breath. And instead of yelling at me or ang being angry with me or kicking me out when I asked them to meet with me, they welcomed me. And some have become as close to me as family. And that's why I think if you have the intention to listen, you can reach across any conflict and any culture. And you don't have to wait for your government to start doing this. You can start today. Since the end of World War II, we've watched nuclear weapons proliferate around the world. My grandfather believed that if we forgot what happened when atomic bombs are dropped on people, they're going to be dropped on people again. I believe this too, but I am a bit more optimistic. I think we can save ourselves. Last year today, 122 countries of the United Nations said that they agree. They voted to adopt the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Of course, the nine nuclear armed nations boycott the treaty negotiations and the vote, and they encouraged their allies to as well. But the majority of the world showed up, and they said that the people are the ones with the power. Because together, we can change international laws, and we can change social norms and the stigma that surrounds nuclear weapons. These aren't just magic weapons. They can be dismantled. We can take out the money that goes into them, and we can boycott the banks that fund them. We have to, because either on purpose or by accident, something like Hawaii could happen, but for real. It could be a mistake, but you don't get to undo that mistake. 
before we get rid of our weapons, we have to get rid of that us first them mentality that keeps us stuck the way we are. We have to reach out and listen. Truly listen. Because in the end, we're just human. Thank you. <laughs>